Good morning and uh, welcome to worship this fifth Sunday after Pentecost at Royal Lane Baptist Church. As you can see, I'm here with Garrett Vickery. Garrett is our guest preacher for this day and we're thrilled that he can be with us. Uh, at the onset, I just wanna say uh, another word about uh, giving and uh, keeping uh, all the ministries of Royal Lane going. You know, it's been our desire through this entire time of quarantine that we be able to, uh, to keep all the ministries of Royal Lane alive. And so, however you can help us with that, because it's sort of a double whammy. We're, we're in the summertime, which is usually a little bit of a low period for giving and still in quarantine. So however you can be of assistance in that, uh, it would be wonderfully appreciated and will help us maintain all of the ministries that we support. So Garrett, welcome to uh, back to the Royal Lane pulpit. We're thrilled to hear you preach today. And uh, I thought I might just ask you a little bit. Uh, some of our newer members may not know that you grew up at Royal Lane, uh, that, uh, that that is so much a part of your heritage. And I'm Laura, uh, Reverend Laura is gonna talk a lot in the Time for Young Disciples about all of your family connections. But I thought I uh, might begin by your telling a little bit about your, how Royal Lane, growing up at Royal Lane, maybe shaped your faith journey. Sure, it's, it's hard to believe I haven't really been around Royal Lane in like 20 years, um, at least, you know, since I left for college, um, but it's, um, it's good to be uh, back with y'all today. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I would have no faith journey without, without Royal Lane. Uh, that's, uh, that's for sure. I, I mean, I uh, obviously uh, came to the church as about a six month old uh, infant um, and, and was privileged to, uh, have been able to call that, uh, my church home. I still do, <laughs> but, um, it's, uh, it's, it's certainly just, um, the corner of Royal and Hillcrest is sacred ground for me. Um, walking the grounds there, um, is, is holy. And there's so many memories of, uh, of, time as a, as a child there as a as a youth with Don Darwin and uh, uh, and Tim humans um, and 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 just uh, for me what I learned from uh, from Don uh, uh, and and from my dad who was the pastor but you know as a kid listening to sermons is kind of dicey um, <laughs> and so, uh, and, you know I, I remember very um, very clearly the work community took uh, and that you had to be intentional about it. And I, I remember, um, you know, people like Jennifer and, and Kelly Harrison and, and of course my brother and others kind of in our youth group uh, talking about what it means to, to be a church and to be a community. Um, and it doesn't happen by accident. Uh, and, um, and then of course with, with Tim as well, this, uh, giving us the, put it, giving it, me the kind of legacy of, of, um, of deep faith and wisdom at the heart of, of the gospel story, uh, and pushing us, uh, to not only, um, receive that wisdom, but to act on it. Uh, and Royal Lane has such a, a wonderful legacy of, uh, of of welcome, uh, of openness, of uh, of the gospel as courage, um, and and we've seen that in you know support of women in ministry and uh, an open and affirming uh, stance on LGBTQ and uh, and racial justice and all the ways that you all are are leading us in this Baptist movement uh, today. Well, we at uh... We at Royal Lane are, in the healthiest of ways, so proud of you and so uh, thrilled that we get to call you our own. And we so look forward to hearing you preach uh, later in our service. And uh, just wanted to, real quickly before we finish our welcome, uh, just hope that everyone had a great 4th of July weekend 
And uh, in addition to Garrett being with us, we're thrilled to have our virtual guest soloist, uh, artist Ken Miedema singing one of his older songs called I See America Through the Eyes of Love. And, we, and Garrett, we made this a family affair. Uh, your mother is playing the offertory today and your brother was part of the recording team, did all the sound for us. And so uh, it's a, it's a all-star victory day. Even the pyramid on the communion table is made of swatches of material from all the members of your dad's neighborhood. And so we wanted Ray to be present with us in the service today. So uh, it, it, we were thrilled that, uh, that we're able to do that. So welcome home, welcome back to Royal Lane, and we look forward to hearing you in just a few minutes. Beloved of God, the winter is past. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. Let us lift our voices in praise to our Creator. Author of life, you cast your glory all around us. You invade our sleep. You reveal yourself in the ancient stories and the give and take of common life. By the power of your Spirit, come to us now, for you have called us to this place. together now for our call to worship, invocation, and hymn, This Is My Song. God invites all who are weary to come. Come now with the burdens of work, home, and community. Jesus promises, I will give you rest. 
God invites all who are weary to come. Come now with the burdens of illness, of fear, of hopelessness. Jesus promises, I will give you rest. God invites all who are weary to come. Come now with the burdens of anger, of prejudice, of alienation. Jesus promises, I will give you rest. God invites all who are weary to come. God invites all who are weary to lay down their burdens. God invites all who are weary to find peace. Jesus promises, I will give you rest. Let us pray. God of love and kindness, we thank you for your model of courageous love. We pray that you will help us to make the stranger our friend each and every day of our lives, turning our lives outward in an ever-expanding sense of connection and love. Amen. family. I'm Donna Ledgerwood and I'm Ruth May and we'd like to invite you this morning to join us out here on the porch. This is where we come uh, many mornings to find sanctuary amid this COVID sheltering. Almost every morning we come out here and uh, say our favorite prayer and I hope you'll join us. It's Psalm 143 verse 8. Let, Let the morning, morning bring, bring us word of your, your unfailing love, for we have put our trust in you. Show us the way that we should go, for to you we lift up our souls. Amen. Amen. You know, um, Donna and I often look to the Psalms for guidance, and one of the verses that we have really in clinging to the last few months uh, is one you're probably very familiar with. It's from Psalm 30. It says, Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. And we come out here many mornings to immerse ourselves in the joy of God's nature. Uh, as you can see behind us, we love to feed the birds. We got 
three feeders here on the porch now, more down in the, the yard. Um, I have been, for the first time ever, uh, planted herbs. I don't know what to do with them. I'm looking toward my foodie friends to tell me what to do with our herbs. Uh, but I haven't killed them yet. And also, uh, you might be able to see over Donna's right shoulder there, where I transplanted some of our perennials into pots. There's that beautiful green, the tiny red blooms. That's the Turk's cap. And next to it, the red and orange blooms are the milkweed. And you may not know this, but uh, milkweed is the only plant that a monarch butterfly will lay its eggs on so that when the caterpillar is born, it eats the milkweed uh, to gain its strength or its stage of life ahead. And pretty phenomenal, really, yeah. to, for it to make it through not be eaten by a bird or something. Another thing that is phenomenal, I think, is just always makes me smile, are the uh, rabbits that are out here. Uh, when we whistle Boomer Sooner, <laughs> the little babies come out to get their baby carrots, um, and sometimes they just go, ah, in the morning. They're just so cute. Um, and speaking of hopping to it, another <laughs> blessing is the fact that I just retired from UNT after 41 years. And I am in process of retiring from the University of Dallas. And we are so joyful that right now during COVID, we do not have to teach online. Yes! Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you could say we have some personal joys to focus on. Spoiled brats. Yeah, spoiled brats. But uh, seriously, we are also focusing on glimmers of hope that we see at the broader societal level. And one of those uh, certainly is that amidst this global pandemic, we have seen the largest multiracial protests against racism in the history of our country. And I never thought I would live to see what I did this past week, that Tate Reeves, who is the governor of Mississippi, signed the law removing the Confederate emblem from the Mississippi state flag. We also are very uh, proud that we belong to a church in Royal Lane, which has put a Black Lives Matter sign or banner on the corner of our church. Laura Mayo last uh, Sunday talked about the fact that Jesus was a person of color. And that's the first time I've ever heard of someone say from the pulpit that no matter whether you want to discuss a shade or not, that Jesus was a person of color and that we need to end this systemic racism. So, you know, I guess that gives us hope. And we know that we're all dealing with a lot of fear right now from different sources. And certainly uh, there may be hard times still to go in this darkness. But we would encourage you to look for the break of morning, because morning is coming. We're going to get there, and we're going to get there together. So as a final thought, let's remember, no facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march, march on, on till victory is won. Amen. Amen. Gather around friends for our Circle for Time for Young Disciples. I am excited this Sunday because we are welcoming back Garrett Vickery into the pulpit. Now, you'll recognize the name Vickery, won't you? I am sitting here by this pyramid created for his father, who loved and led our church for 26 years. And even to this day, when I'm traveling around the neighborhood, people will say, oh, you're with Royal Lane. I remember Pastor Ray. 
Not only do we have Pastor Ray present with us today, but his mother, Sharon Vickery, plays a beautiful piano piece in our service. And his brother, Blake, we all know because he comes every year to walk through Holy Week and is willing to put on a skirt and play the centurion, but also because he's a rock star. Now, I could be saying that because every Sunday when we film church, he's here doing sound, but I also mean he really is a rock star. He plays the bass and travels with bands, and his love for music is really cool. I also think the measure of a man is not just with the family he was born into, but the family that he has. And I have met Finley and Zeta. It was my gift to spend a week with them once when they came to Dallas during the day. They are smart. They are funny. They are kind. They tell me, I think, just in who they are as people, that Garrett must be a pretty good dad. And Sloane, when I was there, was so small that she stayed with her mom. But Sloane, I'll tell you this, I was a Sloan for 25 years until I got married. Now I'm a Keller, but I think all Sloans are pretty amazing, and I think our Sloan will grow up and be pretty amazing too as Sloan Vickery. Now today, Garrett chose something so interesting for us, the Song of Solomon, and this is a love story. It's a love story between two people, but it also represents a bigger love story between a whole people and God. And the images of this love story are the thing that people know best, which is God's natural world. So there is talk of trees and flowers and grass. At one point, he even says, the love of my life has white teeth like a whole field full of sheep. I have never heard that compliment used, but I like it. Now, my future self, the self that will be listening to this present self when you're listening on Sunday, is in Colorado as I'm speaking. And I always feel that there's a love story in Colorado between myself and God. My favorite psalm comes to mind every time we go into the mountains. It says, when I turn my eyes or lift my eyes to the hills, where does my hope come from? My hope comes from God, maker of the heavens and earth. When the boys go fishing, I sit at the lake and the water is beautiful and reflects the world around and I feel the peace of God. And when we go hiking and we're surrounded by tall trees and plants and animals that live in the wild, I think the God who created this and breathes life into this each and every day and night, that God is so big that any problems I have or any problems in our world surely are going to be held and covered by God's love. And in the end, God will be faithful and help us work our way through. So this week, I hope you enjoy the sermon on the Song of Solomon, and I hope we enjoy hearing Garrett come back to us all the way from San Antonio by video. But also go out into your yards or your neighborhoods and think, this is my love letter from God. This is God's way of telling me, I created this beauty so that you might have abundant life. All right, friends, I really miss you. I wish we could be in Colorado together. And I pray for you, and I love each and every one of you. I'll see you next week. Amen. Now is your opportunity to enter your prayer requests into the chat section of the live stream. Please join me in the prayers of the people. Disturbing God, when we forget that you created each person in your image, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. When we impose our own will over those already oppressed, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. When we increase the volume of self-serving speech while others have no voice, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. When we are silent in the presence of enemies of peace, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. When we fail to make room for the needs of others in our familiar places, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. When we turn our backs on the pain of others rather than walk with them toward their healing, shock us into the reality of your justice for all people. 
Today, we pray especially for those that we name now silently or aloud or post in the comments section. God, disturb us with your unguarded compassion until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amen. good to be with you for worship this morning. The reading for today is from Song of Solomon, chapter 2. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away, for now the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its fruit and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the word of the Lord. Springtime forests fresh and green. I walked along a high ridge by the fields of standing corn. I breathed the mountain air so fresh and clean. But I've been in other places where it's hard to breathe the air and the high rise. Nightmare blocks the morning sun. Children play in the dirty streets, and no one seems to care. America's children, look what we have done. foreign 
the shores. Brave the raging peril of the sea. I've seen them suffer hardship. I've seen them risk their lives in war. In order that a people might be free. But I've seen how first Americans were driven from their land. And I've seen the slave ships come from far away. Tyranny is still alive. There's hate on every hand. We must work to end oppression. your hand to the job How many of you are already giggling because the scripture reading for today is from the Song of Songs? I know many of you at Royal Lane, and I know that you are probably finding this funny. <laughs> but you know, this book has been making Baptists blush for 400 years. We might hear this read at weddings every now and then, uh, maybe not even weddings in churches, right? Maybe in parks. Uh, with bongos playing in places we think of as uh, not as holy, right? 
And this is the only passage, the passage we read today is the only passage from the Song of Songs that's actually in the lectionary. We basically skip over this entire book. It's as if we're unsure of its value, mainly because we're uncomfortable with its content. And as we read through it, we never even see God mentioned. The professor and Disciples of Christ minister Stephanie Paulsell says that at the first wedding she ever officiated, the couple picked out a passage from the Song of Songs to be read during the ceremony. And at the rehearsal the night before the wedding, the bridal party gathered and, and got in their places and the family was down on the front row and, and one of the groom's sisters uh, was slated to read the scripture passage from the Song of Songs. And so she came forward to the microphone very confidently and the groom's sister began reading. My beloved is all radiant and ruddy, distinguished among 10,000. And the groomsmen began elbowing the groom. His eyes are like doves beside springs of water, bathed in milk, fitly set. And that began to draw laughs from the family on the front row. But the groom's sister continued reading, his cheeks are like beds of spices, his lips are lilies, his arms rounded gold. But now even the sister reading had to choke back laughter. And by the time she got to the end, to this place where she's reading, his legs, his legs are alabaster columns set upon bases of gold. Everyone was laughing so hard they had to abandon the passage altogether and go to the much safer verse in chapter 8, 6. Just set me as a seal upon your heart. This is a book we are quick to write off. We just kind of ignore it, skip over it. But you know, until modern times, this book was actually central to the devotional lives of Jews and Christians. In the first century, Rabbi Akiva argued that the Song of Songs should be in the Bible because he said, he said, all scriptures are holy, but the Song of Songs is the holy of holies. St. Bernard of Clairvaux wrote 86 sermons on the Song of Songs and barely got past chapter 2. When early Christians read this book, they read the song as Christ speaking to his bride, the church. And in that, they found great meaning. Meanwhile, we don't even know what to call this book. In some Bibles, it says Song of Songs, and in others, it says Song of Solomon. The name comes from the superscription at the start. Uh, it reads, The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. And of course, almost no serious scholar believes it to actually be written by Solomon. Some say maybe it was attributed to him because, you know, Hebrew scriptures record him as being a great poet. Others say, well, maybe it's because it's written to him because maybe, you know, he's the one that had so many wives. But I like what Rabbi Ezra ben Solomon says when he really focuses in on the word Solomon and he translates from the Hebrew and points to the, to the word itself as a hint for the origin and purpose of this song. Solomon is from the Hebrew verb shalem, to, to be or make whole or complete. And it's God that does this work of shalem, of making whole, and invites us into this work. Therefore, this transcription, the superscription, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, means that the song 
is God's song. A song the rabbi says God sings every day. Modern interpreters tend to chafe at the allegorical representation of God pursuing God's people like a lover pursues her beloved. We want to read it for what it says, right? They remind us we don't want to over-spiritualize this book and make it so heavenly that it isn't any earthly good. Modern interpreters remind us that the song is what it says. This book is a celebration of physical love, eros, sexuality, pleasure, the, that kind of love. Not just the kind of love that's safe to talk about in church on a Sunday morning, the kind of love that when we start talking about it, people's eyes glaze over. No, the poetry of the verses we read today expresses the kind of love we don't often talk about in church because church is where we learn things about God. We fill our minds, right, and, and pray God opens our hearts. But the God behind the psalm is a God who places longing in our loins, a God who creates a world meant to be enjoyed and delighted in. This is a God who is the love beyond belonging. That's what the song reminds us. Professor Ellen Davis defines the phrase fear of the Lord in a way that I think is helpful, which I think has a connection to the song. Even though that phrase never appears in this book, she, she says, she, some translate fear of the Lord as reverence for God. But Davis makes the argument that by avoiding the word fear, we take the edge off the point the biblical writers are making. Because this is about a gut response to God. It's an unmistakable feeling in our stomachs, tingling of our scalp, breathlessness when we run up against the power of God. It's this directly embodied response. And as we think about it, aching stomach, tingling scalp, breathlessness. Yes, these are symptoms of fear. But also sometimes the manifestations of love's presence. The romantic love of the song is the type that is embodied in this kind of guttural reaction. So what if we accepted the modern critique of the song, that we must not turn away from the physicality of these verses, but through these words, hear the song also as God's song to us. You know, Bernard of, of Clairvaux interpreted the wall in verse 9 as the human body taken on by God in the incarnation and the lattices and windows as the senses and feelings of the human body. As if Christ's body opened a window for God into human experience to learn what we go through. And through this, God learns of mercy. This kind of aching love is universal to human experience. No matter what's happening in the world, people still fall in love. Relationships grow and blossom and pandemics, protests and war. It doesn't matter what's happening, love marches on. The love described in the song is in some way eschatological, a foretaste of what God dreams for us in the end. Because it's an expression of the love of God for creation, 
for all that God has made. And you know, this is the 4th of July weekend, and so as we think about passionate people, is there anyone in our history, any historical figure more untouched by passion in our minds than George Washington? We think of him as the perfect symbol of, of reason and using the mind over the passions. I mean, we think of him as the quintessential stoic. But we actually have a few surviving love letters from our first president, a few that Martha forgot to burn when she burned all of their correspondence. But you see, in the midst of the Revolutionary War, on June 23rd, 1775, he wrote to Martha, saying, I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time or distance can change. Your entire George Washington. Okay, so it, it's not the Song of Songs, and it's a little weird that he signed his full name in a love letter to his wife, but still, even George Washington had this passion where love marched on in the midst of the Revolutionary War. And you know, there's an old story about sailors on a submarine in the U.S. Navy in the 70s and how they communicated with their families. Family members were able to send messages to the sailors, but the messages could be no more than eight words long. A Bible verse, though, counted as only one word. So the loved ones on shore filled their messages with them. They say all the wives and girlfriends back then loved the Song of Songs. So they would send messages like this, SOS 1-2. And the beloved deep below the surface of the ocean would look up Song of Songs 1-2 in the Bible, which reads, Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Or SOS 4-7. You are altogether beautiful, my love. There is no flaw in you. Or SOS 8-7, a message to a beloved submerged beneath miles of water, saying, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can floods drown it. Those women used those sacred words as a secret message to their love far below the waters. Imagine the sailors receiving these messages and scurrying excitedly to open up their Bibles. It was these ancient words of Scripture that connected them and preserved them through the separation. The love of their love spoke through these words from the song that for so long have been understood as a kind of secret message of love to us from God. What if God really did create us because God wanted to delight in us and us to delight in each other? The Jesuit priest and one of my favorite authors, Greg Boyle, says that from the time his father was diagnosed with a brain tumor until his death, he lasted only about 30 days. And he was in the hospital every now and then over that time. Well, one time Greg picked up his mom to take her to the hospital while his dad was staying overnight there. And as he waited in the driveway, she emerged from the house with both arms full of stuff, just magazines and bags and a big flowery pillow with a big flowery pillowcase. And, and Greg said with a certain amount of snark, you know the hospital provides pillows, right? And she made a face and sighed and said, oh gosh, your father, you know, 
He asked for a pillow from my side of the bed. And Greg says they both eye-rolled their way into the car. And at the hospital, his folks greeted each other in their customary way, the two peck kiss. And his mom stepped into the restroom for a moment, and Greg was at the window of the room, kind of just north of the head of the bed where his father was laying. And he's about to strike up some small talk about the view out the window there. But just then he turns to see that his father has placed the flowery pillow over his face. He breathes in so deeply and then exhales as he places that pillow behind his head. And for the rest of the morning, Greg would catch him turning and savoring again the scent of the woman whose bed he's shared for nearly half a century. Greg writes, you know, we breathe in the spirit that delights in our being the fragrance of it, and it works on us. Then we exhale, for that breath has to go somewhere. To breathe into the world this same spirit of delight, confident that this is God's only agenda. This is why the song is in the Bible to remind us of the way God delights in us and to inspire delighting in each other in ways where mutual love blossoms. And if we understood the capability of all people to love in this way, could we then gain better appreciation or people who are different from us? Could that then build empathy necessary to live in diverse communities like ours? Because you know they've done studies. You know they say the more diverse a community, the less likely people are to engage as good neighbors. But perhaps with the Song of Songs as a part of our devotional life, we might become better neighbors by understanding the passionate love of God that chooses creation, that pursues humanity, not just us either. Not that God doesn't just pursue us or choose us or people like us. God doesn't just choose people whose families are like mine. Maybe with the song shaping our imaginative epic, we can truly begin seeing the world through the eyes of love instead of the eyes of law. Humans create laws. But love has a much older origin. It's been said that we read the Gospels through the lens of St. Paul and that Baptists may be the worst perpetrators of this. We read the Gospels through the lens of church rules and dogmas and traditions. But what if we read the Gospels through the lens of the Song of Songs? What if we saw it as the Holy of Holies? What if we understood the Gospel as the news that God leaps over mountains bounding over hills like a gazelle to come to us. This gospel news becomes not so much a list of shortcomings as a guttural response to the love at the heart of life. You know, when we first moved to San Antonio, Cameron and I adopted this two-year-old brown chocolate lab that we called Amy. Her real name was Amiga. We shortened it to Amy. 
And she was a wonderful dog that had had a tough life. The adoption agency says she was confined to a small cage and left there for long periods of time, basically abandoned. When we got her, she was sick and weak, kind of stumbled around the yard, and she could barely make it up the stairs. And she was extremely shy and cautious. She kept to herself. But the second day we had her, we left the front door cracked open, and she saw her chance at freedom. She bolted out the door, but Cameron saw her go, and she chased after her, finally catching her about a block away, and she hugged Amy and, and led her back to her home, saying, this is where you are now. You belong here. We love you. And she never ran again. She became Cameron's shadow, following her everywhere in the house Something changed for Amy. She realized that she was chosen, that she was loved. And that's the kind of love the Song of Songs is talking about. Love that chases us down the road, pursues us, that, like that father running down the driveway to embrace the prodigal son. Henry Nowen urges us that we must hold on to this truth, hold on to this truth that we are God's chosen ones. And when we claim and constantly reclaim that truth of being God's chosen ones, we soon discover within ourselves a deep desire to reveal to others their own chosenness. This is the gospel message. The message that speaks deep within us, saying, My beloved, arise, my fair one, and come away with me. Amen.
We gather now at the table. This is Christ's table, not Royal Lane's table or your table at home. We gather in a place of hospitality, radical hospitality, where all are welcome. At table, what once was broken is now made whole. And what once was empty is now made full. So if you would gather your elements and join. God in Christ breaks down the walls that make us strangers to ourselves and divide us from one another. We are the body of Christ. Around this table, we enact our faith. This is the body of Christ, broken, which restores us to wholeness. Take and eat. And this is the lifeblood, when poured out, brings healing to our world. Take and drink. Let us pray. All praise is yours, O God. You bring us to this table as fellow pilgrims. Lead us now through each of our moments to that glorious day when all your children will gather as family. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who is our peace made flesh. Amen. So nice to be with you uh, this week. Thanks for having me uh, as a guest. And um, I wish we were in the sanctuary at Royal Lane, obviously. Um, I also wish there wasn't a need for, um, for preachers right now. And so we pray for, uh, for Mike and the whole family, for Ford. Um, God be with them, God be with you all. Uh, everyone wear your masks, of course. And as you were going, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God give you grace never to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. The grace to remember that the world is too small for anything but truth and too dangerous for anything but love. So may God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. And may God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. <laughs>